Hi everyone, it's Dr. Conlin. In today's lecture, we are going to discuss adolescent nutrition. This is lecture one of two on adolescent nutrition. This particular lecture will focus on chapter 14 from your textbook. The overall objectives are 14.1 and 14.4, which are explain why sexual maturity and biological maturity are better determinants of nutritional needs than chronological age in adolescence, and to describe the nutritional requirements of adolescence and how consuming lower than recommended amounts may impact overall health status. We will begin with objective 14.1. Adolescence is usually defined as the period of life between 11 and 21 years of age. In previous lectures, we defined other stages of the life cycle by age, and adolescence is generally between 11 and 21 years of age. During adolescence, we see profound physical, psychosocial, and cognitive changes occurring. And all of these variables influence the eating behaviors and patterns of adolescents. Additionally, we see dramatic physical growth and development occur during this time. The rate of physical growth in adolescents, especially during their major adolescent growth spurt can match and potentially even exceed the rate of growth during infancy. We talked about during infancy, there's a dramatic rate of growth we see from birth to four to six months of age. Infants typically double in weight, and by one year, they approximately triple in weight, which is a really remarkable period of time. The adolescent growth spurt is also a significant period of time where we see this physical growth. And what do we need for physical growth to occur? We need substrate, substrate that we get from the foods that we eat. So during adolescence, we see significant increases in the needs for energy, which is our calories, our macronutrients, protein, fat, carbohydrates, as well as vitamins and minerals. During adolescence, there is a high incidence of nutritional insufficiencies. Why is this the case? Why during a period of such critical growth and development and high nutrient needs do we see insufficiencies? Well, because adolescence is such a critical time in shaping who we are as individuals, what our role is in life, who we want to be in the future, there are so many different factors occurring that unfortunately do interfere with diet. Adolescents are also particularly susceptible to peer influences. So fad dieting is popular, as well as general poor eating habits that result from a variety of different lifestyle factors, um, such as not having a lot of time because adolescents are constantly expected to be in many places. So they have very jam-packed schedules and they're, they are on the go a lot. Potential consequences of nutrition inadequacies include delays in sexual maturation and also potential delays in reaching their final adult height. Eating and behavioral habits originating in this period may continue into adulthood. We have talked about this through every stage of the life cycle, how intervening nutritionally is so cornerstone to setting a person up for a healthy adulthood. That's where we spend the majority of our time in adulthood. However, the majority of our 
habits are formed in childhood even early childhood. So the earlier we can intervene and influence people, the better. However, that influence should occur all through childhood and through adolescence because it is such a pivotal behavior and habit forming time. So we want to set a person up for success for adulthood. Also, let's keep in mind that eating disorders is very prevalent among adolescents because of how important peer perception, peer view, um, fitting in with other people is during this time. Um, Eating disorders can often develop because of of how a person perceives themselves socially and physically, um, and eating disorders are often a manif- manifestation of having lack of control over one's environment or having poor self-esteem, low confidence, um, and so forth. So let's keep in mind that eating disorder is very prevalent during this time and raising children and families in positive food relationships is certainly important in the prevention of eating disorders. Um, But even then, there are some eating disorders with strong genetic components uh, that make people more prone to developing them regardless of of environments. Um, So how do we address that? And we will talk about that next lecture. We also need to consider the fact that Nutrition during adolescence can impact chronic nutrition-related diseases, such as coronary heart disease, certain types of cancer, stroke, osteoporosis, diabetes, atherosclerosis, and others that may have a root in adolescence. So adolescence is an opportune time in life for teens to adopt healthier habits because their adult health behaviors are really being formed during this critical time. Nutritional surveys have indicated that the highest prevalence of nutritional deficiencies occur during adolescence. Adolescent eating habits are not consistent with what my plate recommends. We see low intake of vitamins and minerals in adolescents. We see low intake of fiber. We see low intake of fruits and vegetables. And we see high intake of added sugars, saturated fats, cholesterol, and sodium. So nutritional deficiencies plus poor eating habits in our typical Western culture often result in overweight and obesity. On the other end of the spectrum, we do see underweight in adolescents, particularly among those with eating disorders that result in weight loss. So these are two conditions we want to be aware of and always keep in the back of your mind as a nutrition or a health-related professional. In adolescence, similar to in in childhood and early childhood, after the age of two, we use BMI for age percentile. We can use BMI for age percentile from two to 19 years of age, after which we can use the standard adult BMI categories. And as a reminder, here are the BMI for age categories and their percentile ranges. Please be familiar with these. There is underweight, which is less than the fifth percentile, a normal or healthy weight, which is the fifth percentile to less than the 85th percentile, overweight, which is 85th to less than the 95th percentile, and obese, which is equal to or greater than the 95th percentile. In adolescence, There is growing research that shows the patterns and how they develop over time. We have seen shifts in the patterns and consumption of beverages. This data is a little bit earlier than I'm showing you, uh, 
but it is still consistent. So we have seen increased intake of 222 calories per day per person. So adolescents are eating more, which will contribute to overweight and obesity, just excess calories in general. <clears throat> However, we have seen declines in sugary beverage consumption for children and adolescents, which is a good thing because we've put in public health nutrition, we have spent a lot of resources targeted targeting, we have spent a lot of time and money targeting resources to sugary beverage production. However, it's still high. About 60% of adolescents and children are still consuming more sugary beverages um, than recommendations allow for added sugars per day. Also, we see disparities in race, race and ethnicity we see highest consumption of sugary beverages among Blacks, Mexican-Americans, and non-Mexican Hispanic participants. And these groups are at higher risk for obesity and type 2 diabetes. We know that sugary beverage consumption is a major, and often in statistics, it's defined as a independent risk factor for obesity in youth. That's why there's so much emphasis on reducing sugary beverages. There have also been studies showing that the type of sugary beverage can drink has changed, which in a way is a good thing. We've gotten more away from sodas and non-100% fruit juices. However, there's higher consumption of sports drinks, which if you're not engaging in the appropriate physical activity, uh, sports drink may not be necessary um, to even drink and to need for rehydration. So Healthy People 2020 um, has goals as well for adolescents. Adolescent health was actually a new category that was added. And the goal is to promote health and reduce chronic disease risks through the consumption of healthful diets and achievement and maintenance of healthy body weights. And if you would like to learn more, you can visit the Healthy People website. We are going to move into defining stages of adolescent development. Adolescence is usually defined as the period of life between 11 and 21 years of age and categorizes early, middle, and late. Early adolescence is 11 to 14 years old. Middle adolescence is 14 to 16 years old. And late adolescence is 18 to 21 years old. However, you may see slight variations in the definition of adolescence, and that's okay. Whatever source you're reading, just know what their definition of, of adolescence is. The most important thing is how are you defining your variable? Um, not necessarily which definition is correct because they all have different meanings and applications, but healthy people has defined their adolescence from 10 to 19 years of age. And then they call young adults 20 to 24 years of age. So that's important to know because when you're looking at healthy people adolescence objectives, um, then you know that they are talking about 10 to 19 years of age. So adolescence is a critical time of physical growth and development. During this time, we humans hit puberty. Puberty is the time frame during which the body matures from that of a child to that of a young adult. Biological changes include sexual maturation, increases in height and weight, accumulation of skeletal mass, and changes in body composition, adipose tissue, and bone. The age of onset duration and speed or tempo of puberty varies a great deal between individuals. Females typically begin puberty earlier than males, which means females can typically go through growth spurts at some point earlier than males and actually be taller than their male counterparts. Thus, sexual maturity and biological maturity, or also called biological age, are better determinants of nutritional needs than chronic 
chronological age? Why do you think that is? Why should we then go from a sexual maturity perspective rather than saying they're 10 or they're 11? So they need, they have these cookie cutter nutritional needs. Why don't we do that? Well, because if they go through puberty earlier, they're likely to hit their growth spurt earlier. So they're going to have this, this really rapid and significant increased needs in nutrition and vitamins and minerals um, at all, at all different stages of adolescence, depending on the individual. So this is a really nice chart that has age and years and then typical time frames for puberty for females of 10 and a half to 14 years for males from 12 to 16 and a half years that shows shows when cognitive maturation is typically develops from 12 to 16 years old and then also psychosocial maturation which continues throughout the whole spectrum of adolescence into young adulthood um, noting that cognitive and psychosocial are continuous, we have changes and shifts cognitively and psychosocially throughout our lifespans. But puberty is during the time of adolescence, <clears throat> and it can occur earlier than what's shown here. And actually, because of obesity and because of endoc endocrine effects that obesity does have we do see puberty occurring, occurring earlier, earlier, especially in, in girls. And there are some negative health consequences associated with early onset puberty uh, that are beyond the scope of this lecture to discuss, but also just to keep in the back of your head. So we use sexual maturity to determine nutritional needs. <clears throat> I just want to point out that the central nervous system integrates the action of the endocrine system, which coordinates growth and sexual development. And let's remember back from when we learned about lactation that uh, during puberty is when the machinery for the mammary gland in females is begins and is turned on, giving it potential to lactate to produce breast milk in the future. We don't see that in males. Men have the mammary gland machinery to, to lactate actually, um, but during puberty for them, that shift never happens because we all have different, we have males and females have different hormones. <laughs> We can assess sexual maturation using the Tanner stage. Clinically, Tanner stages are assessed at wellness visits. And in research, Tanner stages are commonly used to assess a child's stage of sexual maturation. And you can adjust, adjust statistical analyses for Tanner stage to account for the variability in sexual maturation if you're doing analyses among children. It's a scale of secondary characteristics that's divided into five stages of se sexual maturation for females and males, and development progresses from pre-puberty to early adult. There's a nice table in your textbook of sexual maturity ratings for girls and boys. We see that the table is divided into girls and boys and then breast development for girls and genital development for boys. Both girls and boys have pubic hair growth assessment. So these are physical attributes that when you do go for wellness visits, do get assessed and a doctor will assess where a, a child or adolescent is on their Tanner stage. For breast development, stage one is prepubertal. Only some nipple elevation is seen. Step two, the nipples become small 
raised into a breast bud. Stage three, there's general enlargement of raising of breast in the areola. Stage four, there's further enlargement with projection of areola and nipple as a secondary mount. And for stage five, there's mature adult contour with the areola in the same contour as breast and only the nipple is projecting. For girls, for pubic hair growth, stage one is prepubertal. There is no pubic hair. Stage two, there's sparse growth of hair along the labia. For stage three, there's pigmentation, coarsening, and curling with an increase in amount. For stage four, the hair resembles adult type, but it's not spread to the thighs. And then for stage five, the adult type and quantity, and it's spread to the medial thighs. Then for boys, for genital development stage one, prepubertal, there's no change in size or proportion of the testes, the scrotum, and penis from early childhood. In stage two, there's enlargement of scrotum and testes, reddening and change in texture and skin of scrotum, little or no penis enlargement. For stage three, there's an increase first in length then the width of penis, growth of testes and scrotum. For stage four, there's enlargement of the penis with growth and breadth and development of glands and further growth of testes and scrotum and darkening of scrotal skin. In stage five, there's adult size and shape genitalia. For pubic hair growth in boys, similarly, stage one is prepubertal, no pubic hair growth. Then there's sparse growth of hair at the base of the penis. Then there's darkening, coarsening, and curling, and increase in amount. Hair resembles adult type and not spread to the medial thighs. And then in stage five, there's adult type and quantity and spread to the medial thighs. So this is how a a clinician would assess Tanner stage in males and females. Also in females, puberty is identified as the onset of menses. The average age of of your of a woman's first period is in the United States is twelve point four years, um, and at that point, of course, they are able to reproduce to get pregnant. Um, so think back then to preconception nutrition. Um, females grow about eight point four to nine centimeters per year with peak growth during sexual maturation stage of two or three, or Tanner stage of two or three. Girls' peak weight gain follows growth spurt. While normal, it's often viewed negatively. Um, They're in our culture, uh, tend to be a value of being thinner. So any type of weight gain can have negative mental consequences um, and not be accepted. So this is totally normal. It's important to educate people on that. Um, however, it it does unfortunately have negative associations in our culture. So weight dissatisfaction is common, which can lead to negative health behaviors such as taking pills or laxatives or developing eating disorders. Girls also deposit more total body fat than boys, um, and that amounts to about a 20% increase in body fat during puberty. So... This is a very fragile time often. Going into puberty is a very fragile time for girls. There's a lot of of hormonal and physical and mental emotional changes to consider when working with this patient population. For boys, they tend to grow between 10 and a half to 17.5 years old with peak between 12 to 16 years. And we see much more variation with boys. They grow about nine and a half to 10.3 centimeters per year. Boys tend to deposit more muscle mass and they tend to gain more weight at a faster rate at approximately 20 pounds per year. And skeletal growth continues longer than girls. So it's not uncommon for you to still see boys growing in college and in their early 20s, whereas girls, once they hit puberty and go through their growth spurt, they usually don't grow much, much more after that. <clears throat> for boys, where are where do we see challenges? Well, well, because because the timing of peak growth can be so variable. If you're a boy and you are a late late bloomer, um, you will have a lot of friends with a lot more muscle mass and a lot more weight than you, and that can be really difficult, especially for boys who play sports. And now all of a sudden, their friends are taller and bigger and faster than they are while they're still waiting to grow. So that definitely has psychological consequences. 
Um, it can be awkward feeling. The growth can be really rapid at some time. So if a boy goes from being like five feet and now all of a sudden they're six feet overnight um, or over a summer, you know, physically they might just feel very awkward as well. So please keep in mind that while we often tend to think of girls having disordered eating or disordered um, self-esteem, these things are still extremely applicable to boys. Um, Self-esteem is very fragile in boys, even though they may not um, talk about it or or show it, but it's definitely there. It's definitely an issue. So we keep that in mind when we're working with both boys and girls. It's a difficult time for everybody. A lot of changes are occurring. So as far as nutrient requirements, we use the DRIs, which we've talked about all for the semester so far. And just a reminder of definitions, the DRIs provide the best estimate of nutrient requirements for adolescents. The DRI is the general term for a set of reference values used to plan and assess nutrient intakes of healthy people. These values, which vary by age and gender, include the recommended dietary allowance, which is the average daily level of intake sufficient to meet the nutrient requirements of nearly all healthy people, the adequate intake, which is established when evidence is insufficient to develop an RDA and it's set at a level assumed to ensure nutritional adequacy, and the tolerable upper intake level, which is the maximum daily intake unlikely to cause adverse health effects. The recommendations for energy are estimated from average energy intake related to average body weight. So there are variations based on height, weight, level of physical activity, as well as growth spurt. An important goal in adolescence is to support adequate growth. So here are energy estimates broken down into males and females by different age groups. Do please be familiar with these. Just to note that the reference population used to estimate these is based on the 1989 RDAs for height. Um, <clears throat> so for males, 11 to 14 years old males and females, it's 55 calories and 47 calories per kilogram respectively. For males and females 15 to 18 years old, it's 47 and 40 calories per kilogram, respectively. And then for males 19 to 24 and females, it's uh, 16.4 and 13.5 calories per centimeter, respectively. So you could use either calories per kilogram or calories per centimeter, whether you want to use height or weight. Um, to uh, to estimate energy needs. And then requirements for protein on, are based on data for body composition and calculation of growth rates. For males and females from 9 to 13 years old, the RDA for protein is 0.95 grams per kilogram. For males and females 14 to 18 years old, it's 0.85 grams per kilogram. This means that protein is about 10 to 30% of total calories for adolescents. There are also calculations to estimate protein needs um, based off of height and centimeters, so be familiar with these values as well. I'm just not going to continue to read through them. As far as carbohydrates and fats, adolescents should consume diets with 25 to 35% of calories from fats with a focus on omega-3 fatty acids. Less than 10% of calories should come from the saturated fat and around 300 milligrams of cholesterol. 45 to 65% of calories should be from carbohydrates with an emphasis on foods rich in complex carbs and fiber. Uh, For females, fiber should be about 26 grams per day. And then for males less than 14 years old, it's 31 grams per day. And greater than 14 years old, it's 38 grams per day. And fiber is... A nutrients shortfall in this country, so adolescents are not meeting their daily recommended fiber intakes. Um, also, just to point out that you need carbs as an adolescent to support that growth spur, um, to support growth in general, to support all the activity that they do throughout their day, um, to support sports. Um, 
we know that breakfast that has the right balance of carbohydrates does show co- unequivocally cognitive improvements in school. So what point am I trying to make right now that adolescence is really not a time for fat diets, even though fat diets are very trendy and popular for adolescents to try? And with social media now and a lot of adults, adult fat diets getting out there like ketogenic diet, you know, it's really not a time for adolescents to try these extreme fat diets, including ketogenic diet, um, because it it will result in nutritional adequacy inadequacies that can impact many, many aspects of their life, um, including micronutrients. There are greater energy demand means um, that are necessary for the release of energy that comes from carbohydrates, including thiamine, riboflavin, and niacin. B vitamins are really important. There's increased tissue synthesis, which means a greater demand for substances needed for our DNA and RNA metabolism, including folate and vitamin B12. And we know that folate, a good source of folate in the U.S. food supply, is fortified grain products, carbohydrates. Folate also comes from fruits from fruits that are um, not allowed on, you know, extreme low-carbohydrate diets. So... Well balance is really key. Educating on the dangers of fat diets in adolescence is also important. And remember, we are still forming that positive food relationship. Going on a fat diet will now just reinforce for a teenager this eat this, not that, this diet culture mentality that we do have in the United States that there's a big push now among nutrition professionals to move away from. The no diet diet is now becoming trendy, right? Um, Which is great because it's so much more focused on what our individual needs are and listening to our own body and eating intuitively and making healthy food choices. Um, So just keep that in mind as we talk about everything. So... Um, rapid rate of skeletal growth during adolescence also needs means a need for vitamin D. Uh, vitamin D enhances intestinal absorption of calcium and phosphate and the RDA 600 I use per day. There's also need for increase in vitamin A, C, and E to maintain structural and functional properties of new cells that are attained during growth. So we need increased calcium for to support the skeletal system. Uh, There's increased iron needs for expansion of blood volume and as well as zinc for the generation of skeletal and muscle tissue. Calcium tends to be low in adolescent diets. The RDA is 1300 milligrams per day. Calcium is needed to achieve bone mass during adolescence. Not having enough calcium can can increase risk of osteoporosis. So we wanna ensure adequate calcium intake so that we decrease the risk of osteoporosis during later life and educating on sources of calcium, including dairy and non-dairy sources of calcium are really important. Iron deficiency during adolescence is huge, um, partly due to the rapid growth. There's such sharp increases in lean body mass in blood volume and red cell mass. Um, These increase the iron needs for myoglobin and muscle and hemoglobin and blood. So iron is really critical. We also want to make sure iron's being met, whether through diet or supplementation, because we know that iron is one of those nutrients that can be harder to obtain through diet. Females are at highest risk. Why? Onset of menses. Once a month, females menstruate and have blood loss. With that blood loss comes iron loss. So females have higher needs for iron than males do during adolescence. Um, They are both 8 milligrams per day from 9 to 13 years old, but from 14 to 18 years, the recommendation, the RDA is 15 milligrams per day for women and then 11 milligrams per day for men. Adolescents have barriers to adequate nutrition. Many of these include busy lives that lead to increased snacking. Research has shown that 83% of adolescents report snacking. 
studies have also associated this with higher total energy intake and added sugars. Meal skipping is common. Only 38% of high school students eat breakfast on a daily basis, including to national data, <laughs> as well as eating away from home. More than one third of meals are consumed away from home. <laughs> and our on the go culture has resulted in reduced family meal times. Family meals promote long term healthy eating habits. I was joking with my husband that, well, at least one nice thing about quarantine is we might be seeing an increase in family meals now, right? Everybody's forced to eat together, um, slow down a little bit and eat meals together. And that is certainly one thing that I hope will stick with us when this quarantine ends. People will really begin to value that time, to value those family meals. They're so important. I mean, research study after research study just consistently shows the importance of having that sit down family meal, turn the TV time, turn the TV off, focus on each other, focus on eating. Food is just so important culturally and in our relationships. And it has such a profound psychological impact when we can do that, when we can take the time to sit and eat with people we love and share in foods that give us good feelings. All of that is so important. So important for intuitive eating too. That's what intuitive eating is, is all about. And other nutritional risks in adolescent populations include strict vegan diets, eating disorders, overweight and obesity, having chronic medical conditions, having substance abuse, low socioeconomic status is a risk factor for diet inadequacies and food insecurity in adolescents. Also adolescents adolescent athletes, and if pregnancy occurs during adolescence, based on what you now know about pregnancy nutrition, you can imagine that during if an adolescent is still growing, hasn't hit a growth spurt yet, and they become pregnant, that's considerable nutrition. We now need to feed a, a teenager through her growth spurt and an infant. So a lot going on there, a lot of support. That individual needs just so much support. And with that, that ends today's lecture. Our next class, we will talk about adolescent nutrition uh, with special conditions, including eating disorders in part two. And then looking ahead, the same, same as um, during our last lecture, module three is due by the 22nd. Your final short review paper is due on the 29th. Module four, which hasn't been assigned, will be the, due the day of the final exam, and then we'll have test three, which I'm still, I need to figure, find out when that will be for you. So thank you. Here's a couple of self-assessment questions you can do for yourselves. Um, thank you for listening. I hope you all are doing well staying safe and healthy. I hope your families and friends are staying safe and healthy. I know that this is now moving into a really stressful time, typical time for a college semester. As we approach finals, there's many projects due and tests coming up. So use time management techniques, um, plan schedules for yourself. You know, if you're, if you're working this is your work too. What you do is very important for work and those experiences are invaluable and will help you get where you're going in life. But really these next two to three weeks also remember that school is your priority. And once in three weeks from now, everything will be behind you. You'll check these courses off of your list. You'll be one step closer to graduation and to meeting your post-graduation goals. So keep going, focus. School is meaningful. What you are doing for these courses right now has meaning, has significant meaning to yourself, to your profession, to those that you'll impact being a healthcare professional. We are now seeing how important healthcare professionals are. And obviously we already knew that because we all study healthcare. Um, but there's so much appreciation for healthcare right now, and I also hope that will continue after this to see how important everybody in healthcare is, no matter what field they're in. Because in times of need and pandemics like this, you know, everybody can pull together and help out wherever needed, even if they're not particularly trained in an area, they can provide support and assistance to those who are trained. 
And I hope in some ways, those of you who are at hospitals or nursing homes are seeing the importance of nutrition during this time too, um, to support patients because we know that malnutrition results in, in significantly adverse health outcomes, including death. So supporting COVID patients with nutrition support is, is, is so important now to do. Um, so keep that in mind, keep going, you're doing a great job. And I, we will meet again next Wednesday via Zoom. I'll send out an email with updates and I'll post more lectures. All right, bye guys.